Good morning. We want to welcome everyone today. If you are a first-time guest or visiting with us today, please fill out a connection card at the Welcome Center out in the fellowship area and receive a gift bag. Children's Church is located in the education wing through the back, uh, the two back doors back there and is open to all children four years old through fourth grade. The nursery is also open. Kingdom's Kids will have something new this year. On each fifth Sunday this year, we are planning to have a special Kingdom Kids. The first fifth Sunday this year is next Sunday, January the 29th, and we will have Pop-Tarts and Pajamas and Praise. We are encouraging our Kingdom Kids to come and wear their PJs that day. There will be a children's ministry meeting on Wednesday, February the 1st at 5.30. Anyone involved in or who would like to be involved in the children's ministry is asked to attend. Supper will be provided. The Minor Prophets Bible Study is now meeting at 8 o'clock a.m. on Monday morning. Yeah, it's a little later than it was, I think, to begin with. Uh, the Ladies' Bible Study is now meeting on Tuesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Divorce care meetings are again being offered through Zoom on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Divorce care is a 13-week video-based support group program where you will find helpful counsel to manage the emotional turmoil and practical tools for decision-making through the pain of divorce or separation. If you have any questions, please con contact Marilyn White, and Marilyn is at the very back, back there. We would like to have this morning a special prayer, uh, a special prayer for, uh, well, let's, I'll tell you what, stand up first, and then I'll have that special prayer, <laughs> along with, you know, opening the worship time. Sorry about that. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we pray for this person uh, and for your protection of them because they have disappeared. Uh, give the parents of that person peace. We praise you because you are a forgiving God, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Forgive us, Father, when we lack the love, patience, and gentleness to deal with others as we should and lack the self-discipline to do as you command us. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. May we each one not be argumentative, be a gentle listener, be a teacher of others with patience, and be accepting of criticism. Give us then an attitude of teachability as we hear God's word spoke this morning. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let 
at every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy of the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I had of me. Scripture reading is Psalms 119, 145 through 152. I call with all my heart, answer me, Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me, and I will keep your statute. I raise before dawn and cry for help. I, put, I have put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, Lord, and all your commands are true. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. You may be seated. Oh, my 
restore, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing Your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name, Lord, I'll worship your holy Tell me, I wonder if you have had the same experience as I have had, where you hear scripture on Sunday morning, you hear it in the message time, and it just lingers with you, it stays with you, it works on you, chisels away at you. That's been the case for me this past week. Uh, we've been going through a sermon series on 2 Timothy, and during our life group, we go through these study questions to kind of reflect and consider the implications of that week's message in our lives. And you may have noticed, if you grab a bulletin on your way in this morning, that you see that there are these questions every single week. Well, last week, we asked this question during our study group time. What qualities or characteristics are important for someone who mentors another person in the faith? What qualities, characteristics are important for someone who mentors someone else in the faith? That was the question. And I've got to tell you, church, that that question has just been gnawing at me all week. What are the qualities, characteristics? What is the job description of someone who leads someone else along in the faith? Someone else who, who helps someone, guides someone, encourages, mentors someone else in the faith. We, we had a lot of good discussion about that question. I wonder how you might answer that question. What qualities, characteristics are needed for helping someone else mature in the way of Jesus? I've been wrestling with that question 
all week because this, this question, it matters to me deeply and personally. Obviously, as a pastor, I want to see each of you grow and mature and thrive in your faith. But I'm also a daddy. And this question is important to me because I'm that mentor, I'm that father, I'm that parent for my boys. And I want to see them growing and maturing in the way of Jesus too. So this is personal for me, but I know it's personal for you too, because you also have people in your life. You have people in your life that need Jesus. People you have some influence over, people who you have an opportunity to impact, to mentor, to equip. You have friends and family, sons and daughters, spouse, co-worker, there are people in your life, you can even picture their faces right now. Maybe some of them are sitting right next to you. People in your life that you want to have a, a faith impact on, that you want to help them grow and mature in their faith. See, it is our mission as the people of God to share the treasure of the gospel with others. It's our responsibility to lead others in the way of Jesus. It's it's our responsibility to steward and share the message of our faith with others, to mentor others, to guide others, to lead, to teach, to model, to invest, to train. Now, this isn't something that is just reserved for the preacher or the elders and the deacons and church leaders. This is the mission of all of us as the people of God that we might pass our faith on to the next generation, that we might make disciples who make disciples who make disciples on to the next generation. And this is a huge responsibility. And so how do we do this well? What are the qualities and characteristics of someone who does that? What does that look like for us as people of faith to invest in others for the sake of the gospel? What does this look like for me? What does it look like for you? If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. As I've already mentioned, a few weeks ago, we began this new sermon series called X Marks the Spot. See, we are on this quest of sorts to find valuable treasure. But this isn't about searching for gold coins or precious jewels or priceless works of art. Instead, this series is about something even more valuable, something eternal. We are talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel is God's loving and gracious invitation to enter a covenant relationship with him through the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's this relationship that we have through Jesus there's nothing more valuable than this. There's nothing more valuable than a relationship with God. The gospel is life-changing, and this treasure is something we need to pass on to the next generation. So how do we do that, and how do we do that well? How do we invest in people in our lives? How do we pass this treasure on to our kids and their kids, your grandchildren, your friends, your family? How do we invest in others with the good news of Jesus? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the res resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His. 
and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. How do we invest in others? How do we invest in others for the sake of the gospel? By regularly and routinely pointing them to the gospel. By pointing them to the gospel. I mean, if you just look at, back at our text, Paul urges Timothy in verse 14, he says, keep reminding God's people of these things. So we have to ask, what are the these things he's talking about? What is he referring to? Is it what he's about to say, or is he calling back from something he has said? Maybe it's both. But to really answer this question, we have to consider the context here. See, Paul has encountered great suffering for his faith. He's experienced pain and persecution and imprisonment for his faith. And now he is on death row because he is a believer in Jesus. And Paul says he's able to endure all of this because of God's grace at work in his life through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's able to endure all of these things because his hope is anchored squarely on the truth of the gospel. Paul may be chained like a common criminal, but thankfully God's word cannot be chained. It cannot be stopped. And Paul's ministry continues through his letters and through the ministry of others, like Timothy. The gospel moves from person to person to person to generation to generation. The faith that um, the Lord, the faith that the Lord um, moved through Lois, Timothy's grandmother, and Eunice continues in Timothy. And now Paul is urging Timothy to continue in this faith. And so can you hear what Can you hear what he's saying in this text? He says, keep on reminding God's people of this. Keep reminding God's people of this hope. Keep reminding God's people of the treasure of the gospel. Keep reminding God's people of his redeeming love and his amazing grace. Keep reminding God's people that Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and he was raised back to life. Keep reminding God's people that God had this plan to rescue and redeem and restore all of his creation. Keep reminding God's people of God's rule and reign through Jesus Christ. Keep reminding God's people of the treasure. This treasure that saved us and this treasure that also now continues to shape us. This treasure that we must steward and we must share for the sake of others. Timothy is to remind God's people of these things, to remind God's people of this treasure, but notice he also gives him this warning to warn God's people against false teaching. He says, you remind them of the truth, but you also warn them against falsehood. The church must avoid godless chatter and foolish controversies, stirring up conflict, needlessly silly arguments, false teaching. These things produce all sorts of toxic results. And he lists several of them, things that are already happening in the church in Ephesus. Division in the church as a result of listening to falsehood. Ruined lives. It produces shame ungodliness. It is of no value to anyone, and Paul says it's spreading like gangrene. It's an ugly image, but it really speaks of something, doesn't it? That false teaching is like this deadly disease, this cancer that destroys the body, and just as cancer must be cut out, removed, excised from the body, this false teaching must be removed from the church as well. Because the health of the church is at stake. People like Hymenaeus and Philetus, Paul calls them out by name. And he says they're leading people away from the truth. They're leading people away from the gospel. These men are teaching things like that the resurrection of the dead has already taken place. And here's the problem with that. It undermines the very truth and foundation of the gospel. If the resurrection has already occurred, then there's no hope 
beyond the grave. This isn't the treasure of the gospel. This is fool's gold, and it's leading people astray. It's causing ruin. Paul warns Timothy about all of this. He says this false teaching is spreading. It's a malicious disease. It's a deadly cancer. It is destroying lives. It is wreaking havoc on people, creating division and disunity, destruction. It's been happening for a while. And so Paul urges Timothy, point people to the truth of the gospel and avoid falsehood. He doesn't want the church to... uh, to be given into useless, unproductive talk. He doesn't want this poison, this false truth to continue to spread. Instead, Timothy and the church in Ephesus must learn how to carefully handle the truth, the word of God, to rightly divide the truth, to be able to separate fact from fiction, to faithfully interpret God's word, to recognize the truth of the gospel, and to reject falsehood. See, Timothy, uh, Paul wants Timothy and the church to build on the right kind of foundation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must build our lives on this treasure and lead others to do the same. And this is what it looks like, Paul says, to be a worker approved. This is someone who serves the mission of Jesus by carefully handling the word of truth. Someone who serves others by passing on the treasure of the gospel to the next generation. Someone who's mentoring well and serving well because they're pointing others to the truth. Look how he continues in verse 20. He says, in a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. How do we invest in others? It's by becoming willing servants of Jesus, useful in God's hands. This is where we say yes to being used by God to change lives. This is where we are open and available to God and allowing him to work in us and through us for the sake of others. Paul uses this example. He says, if there's a house, there are all sorts of different kinds of things in that house. And they all serve a different purpose, a different function. Some have special purposes, and others have a more basic function, but they're all valuable and they they all serve an intended purpose. The same is true of us. God has placed us in his household, the family of God, and we must be willing instruments in his hands. Willing and ready to serve his purpose. Willing to serve others as approved workers. Faithfully guiding others to the truth of the gospel. See, I said before that this message is personal. It's personal to me and ought to be personal to you. Do you want to be used by God to change lives? The lives of your kids? The lives of your grandchildren? Your next door neighbors? That brother-in-law? That sister-in-law? Do you want to be used by God to mentor younger believers here in church? To invest in the next generation? To accomplish the mission of the church? The truth is we will never have a godly influence on others unless the truth of the gospel first takes hold of us. How can we invest in others for Christ unless the gospel has already taken root in our hearts? Just consider these words. Paul continues. Look at verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. 
Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his well. How do we invest in others? It's by living gospel-centered lives. Rather than pursuing the sins and the selfishness of our youth, we will pursue Christ, seek maturity in his name. Rather than stirring up conflict and controversy, rather than unleashing rage on others, we will promote peace and kindness. Rather than being harsh with others, we display his gentleness, patience, and love. Rather than looking like the world, we look like Jesus. Rather than looking like these false teachers, we look like an approved worker serving the mission of Jesus. If we want others to know and love Jesus, then our lives must demonstrate the gospel. If we want others to know and love Jesus, our lives must demonstrate, show, reveal, the transformative power of God's grace at work in our lives. If we want our children to love Jesus, if we want our spouse to share in our faith, if we want our neighbors to come to Christ, then we must allow the gospel to take root in our hearts and change our lives. The question is, do the people in your lives, do they see this influence at work in your own life? Do they see the faith and love and hope of Jesus at work in your heart? Or do they see something else? Do they see bitterness? Do they see resentment? Do they see someone who's always looking to pick a fight and get in an argument with someone? Do they see gentleness and peace or do they see outbursts, outbursts of rage, selfish ambition? Do they see and hear words of patience and grace or bitterness? See, we need others to remind us of the gospel and remind us to live in the gospel. Because it's awfully easy to give in to these selfish desires, these sinful inclinations. It's easy to fall back into those old patterns of destructive behavior, the sins of our youth. It's easy to allow immaturity to reign in our hearts. It's easy to allow selfishness and pride, greed and lust to reign and rule over us. And so this passage forces us to confront some things, to ask this kind of basic question. How am I treating my spouse and my kids? How am I treating the people I hope to invest in for the sake of the kingdom? How am I conducting myself on social media? How am I interacting with that coworker that drives me a little crazy? Do they see the gospel in my life? Do, do they see the love of Jesus in my life? Do they see his, his grace, his truth? Do they see the fruit of the Spirit at work in me? Do they see his compassion and his mercy? Or do they see something else? When I was a boy, we had this 22-pound white furball named Cookie. He was a West Highland white terrier, a Westie, and he ruled the world. Or at least he thought he did. I can remember taking him home as a puppy, and my dad said, he's only going to be in this room. And less than two weeks later, he had the whole run of the house. Cookie barked at everything. He thought he was the biggest dog in the world, and nothing would scare him. Nothing would make him back down. Nothing frightened him. But something would happen to Cookie. If we would get in an argument, my sisters and I, and we'd be shouting at each other, or whatever it might be, Cookie would run out of the room with his tail tucked between his legs. 
And if Cookie left the room like that, that was kind of that reality check of, oh, maybe we better dial it back a little bit. We just made the dog run out of the room. And that would happen. We'd be in an argument. Next thing you know, the dog would flee. Now be honest. There are moments in your life, moments in your home, where maybe that metaphorical dog wants to flee. There are moments in your home where maybe you get a little impatient, maybe you get a little angry, maybe you say something a little sarcastic, maybe you are not displaying the fruit of the Spirit, and that dog wants to flee. Maybe there are moments at work where you get frustrated or impatient for whatever reason, where that dog wants to run and hide. Maybe there are moments in your marriage and the way you treat the way you treat your spouse, your kids, your family, whatever it might be. The truth is we all have those moments. We all have those moments in our life where we unleash our anger. Maybe it is aggressive and loud, or maybe it's passive aggressive. Maybe it's the silent treatment. Maybe it's a sarcastic comment. Maybe it's rude. Maybe it's greedy. Maybe it's selfish. And our behavior makes that dog flee the scene. The truth is, our lives might be the only sermon others ever hear. What is your life preaching? What are your words saying? What are your actions communicating? What kind of gospel are you proclaiming in your life? See, our lives must guide others to the treasure of the gospel. Are you willing to be a useful tool in his hands? Are you willing to be used by God to change lives? Are you willing to invest in the kingdom for the sake of others? See, God has placed people in your lives, people that you love, people that you interact with on a daily basis, people that you have some influence over, a son or a daughter, a neighbor, friend, family member, people to love, people to serve, people to invest in. God has placed these people in your life, and you might be their only map to the treasure. So does your life point them? X marks the spot, right? Is your life pointing them to the treasure? Several years ago, I was on one of those job search websites. I was, um, I was looking at the different listings there, different jobs, and I was reading the descriptions, and I was looking at these job descriptions for these various kinds of jobs. And I remember looking at one of these job descriptions thinking, there is no human being in the world that could fulfill this job description. There is no way on earth anyone could work that many hours, have that many skills, know all of those different things, have that kind of personality. There's no person alive with those characteristics. No one qualifies for that job. And I think about that when it comes to being a mentor, a guide, a leader in the faith. None of us measure up. None of us possess all the qualities and characteristics of doing this perfectly. But that's really the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus is the only one who is qualified, and he came for us. That despite our shortcomings and our failures, he willingly came to rescue and redeem and restore us. And we didn't do anything to deserve this, and we couldn't do anything to earn it. 
but he willingly and freely gave himself for us. And now we have this opportunity because of what he did to point others to the hope that we have in him, to invest in others, because God has called us to participate in what he is doing in this world. See, we serve the mission of Jesus not because we are worthy, but because he is worthy. We serve the mission of Jesus not because we are good, but because he is good. This is why we invest in others. This is why we serve others with his grace and his compassion. This is why we mentor and guide. This is why we teach and train. This is why we equip and empower. This is why we point others to the treasure. Because that treasure can turn our lives into something beautiful. Every single day, I see my two little boys grow up and I see myself in them all the time. Little things that they say and their, their behavior, their little personalities, their likes and their dislikes. And for better or worse, I am making an impression on them. You ever had that moment where you say, oh, I just became my mother. <laughs> I just became my father. My father's words just came right out of my mouth. For better or worse, our lives are making an impression on others in our lives. And we have an opportunity every single day to invest in someone else. Our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our neighbors, our spouse. How are we influencing those around us? Are we shaping them with the hope and the truth of the gospel? The truth is, you and I might be the only map that someone has to the treasure of the gospel. So are we pointing people in the right direction? Are we leading them to Jesus by our words and actions? Are we mentoring and guiding and directing others? Because our lives must guide others to the treasure of the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your word works on us. It challenges us. It convicts us. It stirs in us. And I pray it would motivate us to follow hard after you, to seek after you, pursue you with a hunger and thirst and a deep passion to be obedient to what you have called us to do. And I pray that through our faith, our commitment, our allegiance to you would have a rippling effect on others. That we would be impacting people for your glory and for the sake of your kingdom. That all might have this treasure of the gospel and planted in their hearts that they might be changed by your glory and your grace. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we prepare for communion this morning. Jesus alone for my sins.
Calvary covers it all. That's the treasure of the gospel. In just a moment, the communion ushers will dismiss you row by row that you might come forward to share in your tithes and offerings and also share in the Lord's Supper where we take the bread and the cup stacked together that remind us of the shed blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus that covers all of our sins. We just invite you, if you're a believer in Jesus, to share in that meal with us. Let's thank him for that right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you cover it all. Not just some of it, not just the big things, but all of it. We are grateful for this treasure. We are grateful for the hope of the gospel, the blood of Jesus that pours out this new covenant by your grace. Thank you for this hope. Lord, I pray that we would receive these reminders with joy and also the conviction to continue to live faithfully for you in Christ's name. Church, I just want to invite you, if you have yet to make that decision to be obedient to Christ and his call to baptism, to being immersed, to be dunked under the water and to be raised up to new life, I would love to have a conversation at any point with you about that, um, to know the hope and the, the grace and the truth of the gospel, the treasure of the gospel. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. If you want to find me after the service or contact me during the week, whatever that might be, but I just pray that, um, that 
you feel um, the tug of God's heart for you as we share this time together. Would you please stand as we close our service in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your tremendous grace that saves us, but also continues to shape us, transform us into the people you have called us to be. Lord, I pray that as we go out from this place, that your word would continue to work on our hearts, that it would continue to chisel, chisel away the, uh, the hardness of our hearts and the, the rough areas that we would become open and available and willing to grow in your name for your glory. We pray all of this in the sweet, precious name of Jesus. Amen. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Have a safe and blessed week.